welcome to this event, which is a joint event between the UCL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering, the UK Indoor Environment Group, uh, which I represent both here, and the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. Uh, I should say that the uh, uh, UCL Institute, Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering is newly formed. It was previously uh, called the Parkway School for Graduate Studies. Um, we do a number of uh, programs and C and PhDs. We have a brochure at the back. Um, and we also have launched a new uh, series of events, lectures, workshops, etc. Uh, they're all free and uh, we'll have a look on our website uh, for details of events. Uh, my own talk will be about workplace, physical activity and sedentary behaviour, uh, but before I go on, I should say perhaps a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm a lecturer in environmental and healthy buildings. Uh, I'm an architect by training and I did the MSc in environmental design and engineering here. Um, my research is about the synergies and the tensions between sustainable buildings and health, well-being and comfort, both uh, at the design and operational stage. Uh, I'm also chair of the UK Indoor Environment School, uh, which is a network uh, which currently has about 150 active members uh, uh, concerned with the quality of the indoor environment's health and well-being. It's a very diverse network. We have um, architects, engineers, uh, industry, policy makers, uh, researchers. Uh, from that, we have medics, uh, built environment specialists, etc. And uh, for those of you, uh, I, I see a few members of our committee, uh, uh, Derek, uh, Derek Trump, who is uh, vice chair in fact. Uh, we have uh, Chuck Yu, who is also editor of the Indoor Guild Department Journal. Uh, we have Derek Clemens Chrome, uh, who is on our committee. And have, we have uh, Ken Parson, who was uh, on our committee uh, a little while ago. And one of the things that we do every year is a conference. This is our upcoming conference in June. Uh, we have a leaflet there, and please do uh, pick it up, register, and submit an abstract. Uh, it's very broad ranging, so we would like to see uh, many submissions for very high quality. Uh, so before I go on to my own topic, I'd like uh, to sign on our chair, uh, our chair of the group to also say a few words about the Alliance for Sustainable Building. Thank you much. Hello, good evening everybody. My name is Simon Corby, so I'm an Associate Director of the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products. So uh, that's uh, my main role. Uh, we're a membership organisation. Uh, there's uh, several of you who are members in, in the room tonight. We're always looking for new members. Um, so we've got some membership information in the back. Um, so we always uh, we host monthly events, fast-paced and topical. Um, and this one is on health and well-being. Next, uh, next month we're at Resource Exhibition, which runs alongside EcoBuild. Uh, so we have a stand uh, there. So please come and say hello. And we have a plenary on the, on the 4th of March. Um, so I'm not going to talk any more about uh, our organisation. I want to say thank you very much for coming. Uh, we've got uh, four fantastic speakers to, to listen to this evening. So without further ado, I think we should get stuck in. Uh, join us for drinks afterwards. We'll, we'll wrap up by about quarter past seven and time for a glass of wine later on. Okay, thank you. So, over. Uh, let's get on to the meat of the evening. So, um, I will be talking a little bit about uh, the background to my own topic, which is uh, the notion of obesogenic environments, and more broadly, how the built environment might impact on obesity, physical activity, and sedentary behavior. Uh, to then talk about specifically a research project called Active Buildings, uh, which is nearly completed now. Uh, so, providing some uh, brief concluding remarks, uh, I would also like to mention, I did say the others were over, but not quite, um, that we are considering launching an MSc in healthy buildings or, you know, along those areas, and I would be very much interested in hearing uh, the audience, uh, you know, ideas about that, uh, you know, would there be an audience for it, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, I'm happy to take questions during the discussion or later uh, during the um, network. So we all know that uh, obesity and being overweight, uh, that the prevalence of this has been growing in the last decades uh, in uh, uh, countries such as the UK, US and so on. And we do know that um, the change has been uh, relatively kind of uh, recent, therefore it's very likely that not only genetics but environmental factors are playing a role in this phenomenon. And uh, in this, the built environment may also play a role. Uh, we also know that in the UK, 90% of adults are not meeting the uh, physical activity guidelines. 
50% of the UK workforce is generally engaged in sedentary office jobs. Uh, and we should also uh, remember ourselves that physical activity is good for us, not just because it, it helps us maintain a healthy weight, uh, so in terms of energy expenditure, but uh, maintaining good levels of physical activity is good for us anyway for all sorts of um, chronic disorders and so on. Uh, similarly, and more recently, there's been an understanding that also sitting too much is independently of how much you exercise and go to the gym, is also associated with food health outcome. So much so that now some people are talking um, uh, sitting is smoking, uh, that's possibly taking it a bit far for now. Uh, the actual um, physiology of why sitting too much may not be good for us is not fully understood, uh, but there is evidence to suggest that micro breaks are better as opposed to taking uh, longer breaks. Uh, therefore, for example, in the workplace, uh, there are calls for uh, active working practices and also there is a, an emerging uh, design field called the active design to try and understand how the built environment might impact on uh, physical activity, sedentary behaviour and perhaps obesity. Um, so, the built environment can impact in a variety of ways on uh, physical activity and so on. Perhaps the most obvious example is when our cities began to be built uh, with a car in mind and uh, people uh, virtually had no more opportunities to walk anywhere uh, because it was the way in which the urban environment was designed. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to uh, achieve is a number of things. First of all, um, um, lower food intake and better access to better uh, food choices and this could be for example less vending machines in, in a building or for example at the planning level uh, prohibiting too many takeaways in an area um, and uh, providing more healthy food choices. Uh, we then want generally people to be more active, this could be uh, ideally going to the gym etc but just being kind of moving around more. And within, uh, you know, perhaps more, more relevant to the office environment, less prolonged sitting. Uh, so, you know, people should take uh, breaks more often. Uh, now, this, this area of active design is a relatively new area. It's been researched more from the perspective of how the built environment might impact on the use of active travel choices, so walking and cycling and so on. And from that perspective, uh, there are some lessons already to be learned. Um, uh, telling us that the density of the built environment matters, um, the diversity, i.e. the land use mix, is also important. There are some design aspects, how attractive the area is, do people feel safe in the area, is there green, etc. Uh, how accessible is a destination and how far is a destination. And so, generally speaking, the more vibrant uh, an urban environment is, the more people may be willing to walk around. At the building level example, uh, the area that has been more investigated is how to persuade people to take the stairs as opposed to taking the lifts. Um, and uh, in this respect, a number of st strategies uh, uh, have been tried. Uh, one, uh, perhaps the most utilized because it's quite low cost as well, is uh, point of decision prompts. So where people, uh, at the point where they have to make a choice between the stairs or the lifts, there could be posters, uh, you know, more or less sophisticated, try to remind people or entice people uh, to uh, use the stairs. Uh, now, to what extent is this about the built environment per se, or you know, or perhaps about uh, a more broad behavior change, perhaps is a different story. And with respect to stair design, uh, there is evidence that obviously you have to be able to see the stairs to want to use them, and often is not the case in, in a number of buildings. Um, there is some evidence that also the, the stair design, how attractive it is, is it well linked, etc., may make a difference, even though perhaps the evidence there is, is less clear cut. Then there have been perhaps more imaginative ways of the, addressing the problem with um, uh, a staircase turned into a keyboard so that people have fun using it. Obviously, this is not in a, in a building, I think it's in a, in a um, train station. Uh, or other ideas like drawing lines uh, on the floor to subconsciously nudge people, you know, the keyboards nudging um, towards the stairs. Um, at a smaller scale, um, more and more there is interest in sit uh, stand workstations. Uh, there is a lot of interest in research about that. 
also because it specifically addresses sitting and standing behaviour, uh, whereby there's a lot of interest in uh, uh, sitting. So against this background, um, the, the project that I was involved with is called Active Buildings. It's a collaboration between ourselves, the UCL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering, myself and Professor Alex Marmot, and our colleagues from UCL, uh, from the Health Behaviour Research Centre, from the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Um, so we wanted to first of all understand how and where uh, walking and sitting is accumulated within an office environment. There is simply not much uh, you know, data available on that in, in the UK. And also understand that to what extent there might be an association between uh, the layout or some aspects of the layout of office buildings and uh, walking, sitting and standing behaviours. Um, so when I say layout, we knew that there was more research on stairs. We were interested in, in a different angle, uh, i.e. to what extent the number, uh, the distribution and the location of uh, the desks, the workstations, and also destinations such as the printers, the toilets, the stairs, the meeting room, etc. To what extent the relative spatial distribution makes a difference for people walking, sitting and standing in their workplace. So it's uh, an observational study, we've completed the data uh, collection stage and we are at the final stage of analysis. Uh, so we recruited buildings and organisations, which in itself wasn't easy. Um, we then distributed questionnaires to the workforce, asking things like um, how much do they do at work, how much do they do at home, um, obviously information about age, gender, etc., their perception of the workplace and so on. We also collected uh, digital floor plans and conducted a survey uh, or an audit of the uh, workplace. Then from the people who responded to the questionnaire, we recruited uh, participants for a monitoring arm. Uh, that was a one week long study where participants were asked to wear a, a time-worn device called ActivePal. Uh, they were wearing it for uh, seven days, 24 hours a day, uh, and it measures uh, how many steps you're taking, uh, for how long you're sitting, go, how much you're standing, and transition from sitting to standing. Then, for those organizations who let us install an indoor tracking system, participants were also asked to wear um, a tag around their neck. They were telling us, with a certain degree of resolution, where they were in the office environment, where they're at their desk, or where they're in the kitchen, etc. Uh, we also took uh, weight and height measurements, blood pressure, and waist circumference. Uh, for the building information, we uh, gathered information about uh, floor areas, densities, uh, is there parking on site, number of floors, etc. And we then uh, computed a, a, level, a number of metrics at the workstation level. Effectively, we wanted to calculate the distance from that workstation to each uh, office building destination, the toilet, the winter, the kitchen, etc. Uh, we also calculated the uh, proximity of co-workers, so effectively the average distance of other desks from the participant desk, the visibility of co-workers, so how many people can I see when I sit on my desk and when I stand, because in some cases there are the barriers of partitions, and finally the connectivity. Uh, so how we calculated this is a bit involved, if anyone has any questions later, please uh, ask. Um, we were successful in recruiting a number of buildings, primarily in England and London, I should say, including, for example, the Greater London Authority, uh, Lucas, and so on and so forth. Um, the final numbers that we achieved, obviously, a higher number for the questionnaire arm, around 500 people, from that, around 170 uh, who wore the active device, and a, a slightly smaller cohort for the indoor tracking participants. Uh, we ended up with about 171 participants who gave us valid active health data. Uh, and uh, from that, we noticed that in the workplace, they were spending 70% of their time sitting, 20% uh, standing, and 10% standing. Is that surprising? I have no idea, frankly. But you know, in, in itself, it's um, data that perhaps one could look at uh, later. Um, so our, one of our core questions was, is there an association between the spatial metrics layout <coughs> and outcomes in terms of walking, standing, standing? Now the only statistically significant association that we found was between the visibility of co-workers when standing 
and the average workday step per hour. So how many people can I see at uh, the average workday step per hour? And I think the, the correlation, which was a small actually effect size, was inverse. Uh, so uh, they, they don't go in the same direction. We also looked at uh, the data from the questionnaire. So, uh, for example, perception of distance, as opposed to objectively measured distance from the floor plan. Uh, perception of the workplace, is it extended increasing? Do people socialize with their colleagues, etc.? And um, the only statistically significant association that we found was between stepping and whether management discourages or not uh, unscheduled breaks. So, at the moment, the results are to a certain extent still preliminary, but clearly there is here a role of the social environment. It's not, uh, there is a complex interaction here between the physical environment and the social environment in an office setting, for example, where people and teams are distributed. Often, is a combination of the organizational structure of the organization and uh, you know, the actual layout of the building. We didn't distinguish when we calculated proximity and execution co-workers, if people were in the same team, or if that's your boss, etc. Um, and possibly if we did, we, we may find even more interesting results. Um, so it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, the physical environment is not important, but in fact this phenomena has to take, in, take into account individual factors, phys physical environmental factors and social environmental factors. We found, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, that uh, uh, generally, the people that were moving more in general uh, over the week were also those that were moving more at work, for example. Um, there have been some intervention studies more recently looking at uh, people at workforce moving from one office to another office, which has been specially designed for uh, kind of sitting and standing behavior. They found uh, a, um, evidence of changes in the behavior, but recruitment to the study was difficult, and as we all know, we, they don't know yet if these uh, changes will stay over time. But they again uh, make, make it clear that it's not clear whether that those changes are just in the physical environment or also social environments. Thank you very much. If anyone has any uh, brief questions for, for points of clarification rather than discussion, I'm happy to take it now. I was super clear. Fantastic. Uh, well, well, absolutely, I understand. <coughs> Thanks very much, Marcella. Um, so, all right, well, I'd like to invite uh, Jane Strickwater from World Green Building Council and Chris Pottage to come up. So, these gentlemen are going to do a bit of a double act for us. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we'll just find your slides and uh, move on. So good evening everyone. I'll introduce myself first as James gets, uh, gets the first few slides. So my name is Chris Pottage. I'm at Skanska Green Business in, in London and we're primarily concerned with delivering energy performance contracts. Um, mainly on procurement frameworks such as Refit or Accenture or Carbon and Energy Club. Um, in 2013 I wrote a dissertation um, is looking at how we can enhance the business case for energy efficient upgrades um, to buildings. As I kind of identified in my first year or so of the job, that, that while there is a business case there, it isn't necessarily absolutely compelling and it isn't, uh, you know, it's not something that everybody is, is, is adopting. Uh, so anyway, um, on the back of that I was asked to go on this conference to the UK Green Building Council for nine months last year, I believe it was, and I worked on the Healthy Buildings Report, of which you can see the cover here, and there's a few copies at the back of the executive summary of the shorter versions, and if you'd like to pick them up. So, you will be the executive son tonight. It's fair to say, which is the brains of the operation <laughs> here. My background is I'm, I'm a lawyer, and a bit of my history with this subject, we used to talk as lawyers a lot about regulatory risk. That was one of the drivers way back when, when we were in sort of the early ages to some extent of, of green building. And I remember doing a piece of work I was commissioned to do looking back at some of these different risks. I came across all these cases from the US, 
some time ago on sick building syndrome, which you know, t- term that's not really so much used these days. But it's interesting that that was that was a term coined in a World Health Organization report back in the, the mid '80s, and we used to talk about risk and risk and risk, and we're here talking about the opportunities in all of this now, which I think is, is a really wonderful thing, and I think that that's what this this report we're here to talk to you about really tries to tries to present. So just a brief bit of background. Some of you may uh, be familiar with the report that we at the World Green Building Council released back in 2013, which was really kind of a, a group where we pulled together all the best meta studies from around the world on the business case for green buildings. And we analyzed that from you know the usual stuff on ROI, uh, you know, uh, recouping costs on certain measures, kind of standard stuff. And, and I suppose the part of that report that got by far and away the most interest was the chapter on productivity. And a nice infographic and it presented some of the data from these emerging meta studies and some of the best stuff that we, we gathered. But I, I think that it, it sort of posed more questions than it, than it answered. It gave us a little bit of a glimpse at all this great work that was, was emerging around the world and that's been done over the last decade or more. Um, but I guess the question that came out of this was can we actually start to more reliably quantify some of the financial benefits of what we're talking about here, healthy buildings. And so, so out of that report, uh, there was a lot of energy around the world to, to really do lots more work on this, to try and you know, pull out some of that, some, of, uh, some more research that's been done in this area. And, and the three main aims of the, 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 the report we're here to talk about were really to try to gather that evidence base, to really try to aggregate the best of what we could and, uh, and see what it was telling us. And then actually, because we know obviously that people are looking at this in, in lots of different and varied ways around the world, was to actually propose some common metrics to say, well, can we, to really aggregate data, so many of our problems are about aggregating data so it gives us a clearer picture, can we propose some common, simple metrics that people could work with to start to quantify the benefits of healthy buildings? And that the intention was to reach a broader audience with this, to actually reach out. I just in, I'm always interested to ask, do we have any HR professionals in the room? No, we don't. So maybe we haven't quite. Uh, d- done point three just yet, but I think it's about, I'm banned from talking about green buildings at home on the weekends. Uh, my wife is an HR professional, I brought this report home and she went, ah, that's quite interesting. So it opens up brave new worlds to us in terms of the people this connects with and, and certainly that's the aim of the report to actually connect with professionals from a broader audience than, than we are used to, I suppose, engaging with as a community. So, um, goal number one of the report was to gather evidence and we looked at all sorts of evidence from research in, in all sorts of buildings from hospitals to schools to offices to domestic, uh, domestic buildings and, and so on and we categorised the evidence into the following what we've termed design features. Um, and we found that there was um, a huge amount of evidence, absolute huge amount. I spent months uh, sort of uh, scouring through various journals and so on, and uh, and and there is loads of evidence. Um, but what we also found is there's um, you know there's a there's a great deal of variation in the methodology applied, the metrics that are used, and the results, the numbers that come out of it. And for that reason, in the report, we were a little reluctant to, uh, to really put our name to certain numbers um, that, you know, in, in terms of percentage improvements in productivity or, uh, or cost savings or cost benefits. One thing that became very clear, though, uh, looking at the top three design features there, is that there's an overlap between energy efficiency and health, well-being and productivity of the building. Um, so, I think the main challenge for us as an industry is, is to understand these, these relationships a little better and understand the outputs a little better so as we can inform design processes a little more. Could you move on? So, what does this mean to the investor or to the business case? Well. One thing that is abundantly clear is that people cost an awful lot more money than energy. Uh, If you look at the breakdown here of typical organisational operating costs, you can see only around 1% is spent on energy, whereas 
got about 9% on rent and 90% on people. So it, it goes without saying that the smallest improvements in your in your people costs or the smallest efficiencies in your people costs will, will greatly outweigh energy efficiency savings. Um, imagine some of the most ambitious and successful uh, energy efficiency projects might save you 40% on your energy. That's quite a quite a good saving for a, for a refurbished building. Um, well, if you save half a percent on your people costs, that will actually be more. So, I think the key here is, if we are looking at energy efficiency as a value driver for high quality sustainable buildings, perhaps we're not looking at the whole picture. Um, and there are actually other benefits there for, to be quantified and to be demonstrated, which can really change that business case. For me, I, you know, I'm a policy model, and this is the stuff that gets me really excited, some of the kind of macro numbers. And it is very difficult to extrapolate from the studies many of you are involved in that we've tried to aggregate in these reports, precisely the kind of impact this is having on a national level. It's, it's an imprecise science at the moment, but. You know, in, in the Brussels sphere that I inhabit, there's been some great stuff on renovation and the energy savings and what it could mean for Europe's economy to capture those energy savings. And you saw in the context of our office buildings, really we're talking quite a small part of the puzzle there. And, and these are just a few of the studies that we found in terms of some of the, I suppose, largely negative impacts in terms of things like absenteeism and poor mental health in certain countries. And we know increasingly, obviously, that these certain design features can optimize elements of our, of our built environment which have an impact on these things. And in talking to, to policy makers about buildings, we spent years talking about climate and these energy assets and you know it doesn't connect with, with, with so many people. But this is this is at the absolute heart of what key political figures really care about. So I think we're just starting to be able to tap into a much larger debate than buildings, I suppose sustainable buildings have been a part of historically. And the question, as Chris said, that really matters is how does my building impact my people? You know, when, you're when you're going in and having conversations with the CFO, you saw that graph, 1% of costs, energy, yeah, a little bit on rent, and we know green buildings you know, might rent for higher prices in some instances, great, but that's, that's where the CFO goes, hmm, okay, that's, that's really interesting stuff. These are, these are my main assets as an office owner, so that's what, that's what really opens doors, I think. Okay, so the um, the second goal of the of the report was to propose a common set of metrics for use in an office setting. Um, so after our literature review, we'd uh, we come up with a list of I think from memory it's around forty three different metrics, which have been employed at different research projects all over the world in different building settings. Um, so our our key goal is. Is to, was to select metrics that are relevant to an office. So we came up with a set of um, evaluation criteria, such as cost of, of implementation, uh, disruption caused, uh, reliability of results, and, and various other criteria. And we narrowed it down to a list of around 10 metrics, and then we conducted an HR survey where we um, we sent out a survey with the metrics and questions relating to them to, to around 25 different companies globally and got their results and we came up with this set of six financial metrics which forms one part of our metrics framework. So, on the previous slide, we were looking at the financial metrics in the bottom corner here, uh, which will tell you a certain amount. They will obviously tell you how much your staff are costing you and uh, how much recruitment and training are costing you. But in relation to your building, it may not tell you a great deal. What we are particularly interested in is the relation to some other metrics. So, perceptual metrics, perception surveys, what do, what do people think about their buildings? What bothers them on a day-to-day -day basis? What, what affects their concentration or their productivity or their, their self-satisfaction or well-being? And what about physical metrics? Well, what, um, what is the air quality like 
at any given time in any given building. Um, generally, we don't know on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we go about our daily lives and we, we might have a, um, a thermometer on the wall, but you know, beyond that, a lot of us don't know. And until you get into technical details of uh, indoor environment quality, as uh, Mark Chala does, um, you're not really going to know a great deal about that relationship. So what we're really looking for here and what we're really encouraging organizations to do is to start using those financial metrics, which most companies already collect, and evaluate them in relation to the perceptions of your, of your building users and in relation to the physical environment. To a large extent, you know, this, this piece of work for us stems from the business case reports, and this really helps us reframe that case, as I say, going into the CFO and saying, well, this is what it means in terms of your people, not just in terms of your energy bill, and also really looking at, actually, what are some of the low-cost things that you do that have a really high impact on productivity? What are some of the interventions that can, can get asset owners started? I think there is a huge missed opportunity here in this space, clearly, and, and this data collection effort trying to push forward now is really about trying to crystallize what, what does it mean and help us present the business case we've so often cited as energy efficiency, all these things, ROI, you know, cost for coups, in a different different way. Okay, so again we are we're really looking looking to encourage organizations to use these metrics and, uh, and evaluate them on a, you know on an ongoing basis. And the extent to which organisations do this, and the extent to which that data is pooled and shared and benchmarks are developed, will, will largely determine the success of, uh, of these metrics in, in enhancing that business case for sustainable buildings. Um, you can see a lot of opportunities here to, uh, to evaluate your building, um, which is absolutely what we encourage. And the next phase for us was going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of practical applications that companies like Scanska are kind of taking this on to the next level. But this was really capturing the data and trying to say, well, here's a framework that people can maybe use, or we can test a little bit and figure out what doesn't work and what does work with it, but move forward now and start trying to aggregate more comparable data. But the next phase will be put a little bit mostly at offices. What other sectors should be a focus? building typologies should we be really looking at? Retail is probably one of the areas we're, we're looking to explore. But what are some key you know, areas of interest for professionals, but also that, that are going to be springboards to actually making this a much bigger issue on the local stage? And again, what are some of the key sorts of organisations um, that we want to, to engage going forward? Uh, again, these are all sorts of key questions for us in terms of actually, you know, that question, who are the HR professionals in the room? Who can we as, as groups of building professionals be reaching out to, to make sure that this message is kind of rebounding uh, through different corridors? And as I said, for me, for me as a policy one, a big question is, what role might policy have to play? When we go into a room with policymakers in Brussels and we talk about energy efficiency, they sort of yawn a little bit, they've heard it for, for a couple of decades. But I think this, this opens up an area where we can really engage on, on a subject matter we're very passionate about at a political level. And I suppose one, one role is what does industry, what role does industry best practice have to play here, but what role might policy play? So things like indoor comforts and stuff, like that, these are things that the EU is starting to look at in terms of that same sort of question, how do we aggregate data to tell us, you know, what is a good building from an environmental performance perspective, and also what is good for people. Policymakers have started to look at this now. So in terms of next steps for us and the next phase, as Chris said, the main thing is actually saying to people, you know, let's engage and drive forward more of that, that data collection. Let's try and use these metrics uh, and actually start to get a clearer picture. But also we're looking at you know, how do we expand the scope of this? How can we connect? Who can we be connecting with? And again, what doors might this open in, in policy terms? So the sort of practical application in terms of what's going to be on that goes. So, um, at Skanska, clearly by sponsoring the report, they, they are demonstrating that they're very, very keen 
to explore this area and to better understand that relationship between building and occupant. And of course, on a personal level, I, uh, I'm also very keen to do that. Um, so what better place to start than with buildings that we occupy? Ultimately, we would like to develop a, a, a product to take to market and to offer to our clients. But at this stage, as we are learning more about this relationship, we, we, we've started to evaluate our own buildings. Um, so since the report, I've conducted a, a pre-move survey on one of our old office buildings, which will be followed in about a year's time by, um, by post-move survey. So then we develop comparable data on, on perceptions of the building and we get to understand a little bit more about what works for the people in the office, what doesn't work, which specific design features have specific outcomes or carry the most impact. While this is ongoing, we are also sampling some, um, some technologies for measuring indoor environment parameters such as air quality, temperature, noise levels and so on. These are three examples here. Um, we've recently ordered some cube sensors, which are the ones in the middle, and it's a, it's a desk mounted uh, piece of kit, shall we say, that, you, that will monitor on, on a weekly or two weekly basis and will give you live readings of, of, of the levels of VOCs uh, or uh, contaminant levels or temperature levels on an ongoing basis. And finally, we are working with our HR department to gather <coughs> or gain access to the, um, to the uh, financial metrics and looking at how we can develop them um, in the most effective or efficient manner to go with these physical and perceptual metrics. <laughs> There's a link which you can, can download it. Um, and certainly, those were some questions we were asking ourselves, but I'd love to discuss your thoughts on these kind of things actually. Where are the areas of focus? I love France has already gone on to mandating uh, some of that monitoring equipment, particularly for air quality in schools. Great place to have them, no place more important to look after the health of the next generation, great place to educate around actually some of this new emerging technology. So interesting in, uh, in your thoughts on those when we move on to some debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, really, really interesting. So our last speaker tonight is uh, Gary Newman, who's a, the Executive Chair of the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. So over to you, Gary. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. A few familiar faces here, which is a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. We're supposed to attract new faces, aren't we? But, uh, this is a relatively new subject for me. I haven't talked about health, um, but we're involved in it in the ASVP in, in some way, and I would like to think that we'll get more involved in it. Um, it's interesting, I was thinking when you were giving your presentation about productivity issues with, with health, because I would bet if you go back to the beginning of building regulations in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I bet health was at the core of it because they were concerned about productivity of workforces in the factories. So it's quite interesting that, I mean this takes it forward massively, but it's not a new subject. And perhaps with a, the, the lack of a holistic view of green building that we've had, perhaps because of the energy performance focus that we've lost sight of this health issue. Um, it's got to be core to any focus on sustainability. So it's great that it's back on the table and um, it'll be good to see some, some strong um, policy drivers that uh, will take it forward. Um, so, uh, so I'm the uh, chair of the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. Um, uh, Simon's given you a, a brief sort of intro, but we're all about products um, and their role in the built environment. Buildings are made from some of the parts, uh, and products actually have a big influence on the health of buildings. And I'll talk
talk a little bit about, about that. And really my role today is to make sure that we keep products at the core of this discussion about health. It is massively about design, but it's also about the products and materials that we put into uh, our buildings. Um, as Sam said, we're a not-for-profit, we're a member-led organisation. Uh, we like to show our members because these are the, the pioneering members, if you like. Um, as far as we're concerned, and you'll see some of our members here, Skanska are one of our founding members, and I hope I've got an up-to-date slide with Skanska. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Such a dynamic enterprise, and we've got new members piling in all the time. It's very hard to uh, stay up-to-date. Um, I like to think we're quite unusual in that we are mission-driven, so companies join us not because we'll push their agenda, but that because we have an agenda that they believe that we have a mission that they think if we're successful in driving that mission forward, then uh, there'll be some benefit to the company, so over the longer term. So it's, it's actually, it's a tough business because you're not representing a vested interest, but actually it's an incredibly enjoyable enterprise to be involved with because you're not beholden to the public sector grants, you're not beholden to business through uh, being a trade body or a trade lobby organisation, you're very much defined by the mission, which we can always go back to. Um, and I think it's, um, it's an interesting uh, enterprise in that respect. Quite hard though to um, to um, keep the uh, membership rolling and funding coming in because uh, we're all about in the business world we're about what's in it for me uh, and normally that means short term so uh, our members tend to take a much longer term perspective so uh, today is about health toxicity and construction products so I've just picked a few issues there I think we could have lots and lots and lots of issues that you put down. Health is a funny one, it's a bit like fire. If you say the wrong thing, you get sued. And it's easy to create fear um, uh, and, and overplay things or underplay things. And so, you know, the whole issue of indoor air quality has to be approached with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of caution. Um, <clears throat> uh, and really, mostly what I'm going to talk about here is about indoor air quality. So the impact that products have on indoor air through VOCs, there are also issues through uh, humidity and how products might help to mitigate humidity. I'm not really going to talk about that. It's a product design issue. There's also issues around health, health issues uh, during production of certain products, health of workers, uh, and all, which I'm not really going to cover. And there's also health issues around disposal and what happens in the environment after the product's been uh, uh, either thrown away, put to landfill, and issues about bioaccumulation. But these, these, this list is ones that I've been directly involved with through uh, my work before the Alliance, which was about promoting more bio-based building materials. When I say promoting, I was manufacturing and selling these products. Um, and uh, clearly certain products can create uh, particulates in the atmosphere. Um, many products give off VOCs uh, of all descriptions which can have an impact on uh, human health. Formaldehyde is the one that we all know uh, and the particle board industry hate. Um, but there are many, 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 many other issues. Fire retardants are a key question and I think this product and design interface is very, very interesting. Because we have this fear of fire, we tend to load up products with fire retardants, and in many cases, completely unnecessarily. And what we're creating in that situation is a highly toxic material. Um, you could also put on there um, wood preservatives for, for timber. If you design well with timber, you don't need to put toxic preservatives in. So, you know, there's a really important issue there. There's obviously the paints question um, and the VOCs from flooring. And I was looking, I was trying to find the case study on the train on the way down, but uh, it was a, a conference I was at, a Nature Plus conference, which I'm going to come to in a minute. And they presented this fabulous building that, that ticked all the sustainability boxes. Um, 
But uh, when they came to occupy, I think it was a hospital. It was a hospital. When they came to occupy, the VOC level way over, and it was all caused by the flooring and the glues in the flooring. Actually, not the flooring material itself, but the glue, and it caused them to have to rip all the floor up ultimately and cost uh, millions. So products. What I'm trying to communicate here is that products are massively important to this this health agenda, this emerging health agenda, and that is another one. Uh, of course, um, a product might be fairly safe in its final form, but in the intermediate forms, there are risks and health issues. Um, Nature Plus was heavily involved in looking into um, ethyl diisocyanate. Binder for creating moisture resistant particle boards. Um, should they, well, we really should talk about it in the context of nature plus, but it's a fairly safe benign material in the final product. It doesn't off gas, but there are significant issues in the production process. Um, so, lots and lots of different places where it matters. So, I, I think really, because um, I'm no expert on health, I'd like to focus a little bit on nature plus. Um, because that goes to the core of the Alliance for Sustainable Building Project. We uh, support this label. We're the UK representatives for this uh, label. You can tell it's um, not a British developed label, it's a German label because there's a huge amount of technical information on here which nobody will ever read. If it was a British poster, we'd just have a couple of words to say leading eco label on the planet or something like that. Um, it's Pretty complex business. We have um, Tom Woolley at uh, the back there who sits on the board of Nature Plus. I'll talk about how it's, uh, its governance in a minute. But it began over 10 years ago. It emerged out of Central Europe basically because um, there was a whole load of competing claims, as it still is, about products. And uh, what, they, what Nature Plus wanted to do was create one organisation uh, rather than have 20 different labels saying different things, creating a very confusing. So it emerged from that sort of early days of green building uh, and it emerged from the training community rather than the manufacturing community. So um, now it's developed into quite a substantial uh, label. It means quite a lot to the companies that have it, particularly in Central Europe, Germany, Switzerland, France, Austria. It doesn't mean anything to the UK market yet. The Alliance, our organisation, is trying to change that. Labels are very, very complicated until there's a demand, until the consumers are asking for it, and they want to pay for it, uh, and vice versa. So uh, they take a lot of time. My sister in used to work for the Fair Trade Foundation, and that just went along very, 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 very slowly until the country. So we're hoping that trajectory will come for uh, Nature Plus as well. Um, we have an ever growing list of products. It matters in public procurement in Austria. We have an empty class that's deemed to prove all sorts of things, which shortcuts a lot of it. For the uh, standards people, it's a type one label. That means it's third party accredited and it means the product meets certain predefined criteria. Whereas a type two and type three, come on which way around. One is that it's not third party, it's basically a self claim and the other means that it's, for example, like an EPD, you have looked at its impact, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or bad, it's just a statement of transparency. So, so type one means that it's transparent, it's third party accredited, and the product has met certain predefined standards or limit values, if you like. Um, the aspiration, I want to talk a little bit about ICL because I think it's important. Um, the aspiration is that Nature Plus will become part of the ICL approved list of labels. If you like, ICL is the label for labels because there are zillions of labels. Some mean something and others don't, to be frank. And if you can't, if there isn't a mechanism of policing labels, then chaos ensues. So ICL are trying to um, create some, and it's, a, it's a, an office in London, and I think they're profoundly interested in what they're trying to do. Uh, and their, their mission is to demonstrate and improve the impact of standards, particularly say, sustainability standards. 
uh, improve their effectiveness. Um, they're not hugely effective in the construction market as yet. Uh, so how do we change that? Uh, and to uh, increase the adoption of what they call credible standards. And, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that, actually, because what they've, what they've done is done a huge amount of work trying to define what a credible standard is. Because there are lots of standards. You know, how do we know, let's say Brian, for example, how do we know when that's creating any change? How do we know if it's a good standard? Or actually, a bad standard is a very important standard for the UK, but is it creating change? How do we how do we think about it? How do we how do we have a, a method to assess? So, is it really tackling? Is the standard really tackling the key issues around sustainability? I mean, is it is it relevant? Is it really relevant? Does it drive change? Or is it simply just a marketing tool? Is it rigorous? Has it been developed with due respect to uh, all the parties that, that, that it influences? Is it impartial? Is it transparent? Critically here for me is, is it truthful? So what, what a standard says about itself, does that relate to what it actually delivers? Um, and the other thing that I see that I see do is they say that if you have a standard, you should communicate and measure its impact. So I haven't seen many papers that said, here's a standard that we've introduced, call it lead, call it whatever. What impact does that have on sustainability? Have they measured it? It's not enough to say there's 100 buildings assessed to lead or a million buildings assessed to lead. I want to know what sustainability improvements have ensued because of it. So I think I just want, it's a bit of a side issue, but I just wanted to um, flag up this organisation because I think they're, um, they're very interesting. Efficiency. Oh, efficiency is really about, is it just repeating somebody else's standard? Is it, is it just creating unnecessary complexity? Um, so, back to Nature Plus. Um, uh, so what, what does Nature Plus say about product? Uh, it says it's made from sustainable raw materials. That's easy to say, not easy to define, uh, and it's a big fact definition. In fact, if you want to know what sustainable, if you want a definition for sustainability, Construction product, uh, I, I will commend the Nature Plus basic criteria to you, which is downloadable from the Nature Plus website. Um, it's very holistic, it deals with all the issues about supply, extraction, all that kind of stuff. They certainly wouldn't certify a product if they can't determine where the raw materials come from, which is quite interesting with petrochemical products and steel products because there's no supply chain governance. Pick apart, certainly in petrochemicals, you use steel as well. You can't go to a petrol station and say, oh, I only want um, Saudi oil or Saudi petrol. Um, or I only don't want Saudi petrol. Um, it means there's a sustainable end of life strategy, it means there is a low embodied carbon, proven technical performance. So, with Next Plus, you wouldn't be able to achieve the certification unless your product has met the performance uh, standard third party again. Uh, it, it, it defines product category leading in sustainability, so it doesn't seek to compare apples with oranges. It's trying to say what is the most sustainable product within any given product category. And I'll come to how they, how they do that in a minute. It also uh, looks at toxicity, which is where it relates to um, this health agenda. So, you cannot achieve Nature Plus certification without having BFC testing and ensure that your product meets the defined criteria for that product. It's not a universal criteria for every product, the criteria are different for different product categories, which is where a lot of complexity comes in. Uh, so I, I, um, I sit on the Criteria Commission, which is the commission that develops the details of the standards for a particular product. Uh, and it's complicated. And I'm really glad that it's run out of me and not okay because maybe it's just me, but I think they're just relevant to the town. Is that just such a cliche that can't be true? Mm -hmm. wrong? <laughs> so, um, so they have a board, and the board is made up of these different organisations. Uh, so it's a balance between industry, um, environmental organisations, trade unions, testing institutes. Um, so got very good comprehensive coverage uh, because no new standard can be improved 
that is approved by the board. Uh, for, for, for getting a product um, certified, there are three levels of compliance. You have the basic criteria, which I mentioned. So that's really the entry point to determine whether you can go to the next stage of nature plus certification. And if you don't know where the raw materials come from from your product, you can't have certification for nature plus. So pretty tough um, for those products made from raw materials that are not traceable. Um, then it has product group criteria. So let's say it's a standard for bricks. Um, and then it has a product specific criteria, which is where a lot of detail about uh, specific types of products uh, are found. And of course, if you have a product which is largely in the external environment, it's on the outside of the building, the demands on its emissions and GOCs are not so demanding. They still test, they still have to be tested to meet certain standards. The test will make them more money to be on the inside. Uh, I've talked about the Criteria Commission. Uh, a couple of new developments. So um, there's a new standard being developed, and it's a big move away from where H plus has been, and that's a standard for cement. Uh, and uh, it's not certain that the standard will emerge um, because there's a lot of debate about what is a product category leading cement product, uh, and certainly the issues. Metals and other materials to find its way to cement and concrete is part of that debate. Uh, I missed that meeting, so I won't <coughs> exactly how that's developing. But it will take two to three years before a cement standard will emerge, if it emerges. Uh, Nature Plus has just launched a product database. So Nature Plus started before EPD, Environmental Product Declarations. So, Developed its own uh, methodology, life cycle analysis methodology, and it, it didn't publish all that information. It just said it's got the label or it hasn't got the label. And of course, with the emergence of EPD, people are now and the tools to interpret environmental product declarations. So you can put these into BIM tools or whatever and start to make decisions. Um, having the label is no longer sufficient. You actually have to have the data, the underlying data. And so that's what the product database is about. So Nature Plus has spent quite a lot of time harmonizing its methodology, its LCA, its life cycle analysis methodology, with that of um, EN 15804, so that can be used in the tools and compliance and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, this is a, a graph that a colleague put in for me, a, a, a slide that a colleague put in for me earlier today, because um, there is this thing. Uh, emerging from North America, which is the health product declaration, which is a bit like uh, an EPD, except around issues of health. Because of course, the environmental product declaration is, uh, does not concern itself with what emissions the product might involve in use. And so there is a requirement, there is a need for uh, having uh, an agreed system for analyzing products. So Nature Plus has its method um, which seeks to be more demanding than any uh, nationally developed method and there's stuff going on in France in terms of EOC emissions and limits as it is in Germany there's a limited amount of harmonization and then there's uh, this work going on in North America which I think is quite interesting but don't ask me any questions on it please because uh, I know very little about it um, and really I suppose just to <coughs> I think draw my little presentation to an end. Yeah, I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of what Nature Plus looks at in terms of uh, indoor air quality, in terms of uh, the health issues in your mind. Uh, it looks at all sorts of things. These are just the bits that I drew out from uh, the VOC. So this is VOC, this is <coughs> VOCs that are carcinogenic, mutagenic, and toxic for reproduction, I think, at the CMR. Anybody know? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is a wood fiber based insulation product, um, which, interestingly, can have problems with nature plus certification because natural materials give off VOCs. 
Uh, this is a product that's been certified. Uh, total volatile organic compound compared to that level. Uh, total semi volatile at that level. Formaldehyde at that level. Odor assessment. And I don't know how to do that test. But three. Uh, pesticides. Oh, I know, halogens, halogen stuff and, and uh, biocides. Um, and that's largely, I think, as a fan, it resides in the fibre from the, from the growing, I think, rather than something that's added to the product. <coughs> so I could be wrong. And here's just another example of a, an interior door that's been through Nature Plus certification. So there's a few more things on here. The thing about Nature Plus is it has the freedom, because it develops standards for products, specific product categories, it has the freedom to say, hang on a minute, we've got that LCA methodology, we've got this VOC stuff, but actually they've got this problem. So, so they, it's got the freedom to introduce new requirements uh, because every product gets into different situations um, and it's a holistic. Standard. So, a door, there's, um, there's a few other categories put in here. Um, so, it's not, it's not a fixed system that delivers truth in all cases. So, it's, it's a developing system. Uh, the standard is fixed for three years. So, if you go through the certification, you will have that, and then you have to reapply. And the standard may change in those three years. So, um, so my conclusion really, or I just want to keep people in mind, is that products are part of this health agenda. Um, certainly from an ASBP perspective, we want it, the issue about health to grow substantially in people's consciousness because we've got a low carbon building that makes people sick consume a lot more carbon in the hospital. Um, you cannot, you have to look at it and listen to the end of this. So our, our message. So yeah, thank you. Thanks ever so much to all the speakers. I, I think uh, I'll ask the speakers to come and stand at the front rather than sit. Um, Perhaps a little bit of jogging up and down. Um, but uh, I just sort of wondered if there are any uh, points, questions, or areas of clarification. So over to you to uh, open up the dialogue with any of our speakers here. So are there any points? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, no massive surprises. 
in terms of what was there. But again, I mean, for me, in terms of the dialogue that we have at a policy level about what is good technically and what ought to become, I suppose, best or standard practice, a lot of the time is is actually looking at some of the kind of trade-offs, I guess, in actually getting a building that, that it is a great uh, building from an environmental performance, or particularly from a climate performance, because that's the focus of regulation, and getting it right for people in different climates around the globe as well, and some of those, you know, the concessions you have to make to get get it right either way, and, uh, and I think, again, that stuff is it's all there, it's been there for a long time, but it certainly at a policy level, it felt like we haven't really been having a really kind of honest upfront and very informed discussion about it, even though all that evidence is, is there already, actually, so that's certainly something that we've taken into a lot of our, our policy work. Just, can I add a question to that? I often find that perhaps we don't do enough looking back, um, positive evaluation, many of the things sort of alluded to the need to survey, the need to report that. Do you find in your in the work that that comes up as an issue at all? Is it the start of your policy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a European Awards, which is largely there to try to raise awareness for European policymakers as much as anything else. And one of the requirements is you can't win an award unless you've got some actual data on the, on the project. And I think that's you know a huge area that is missing. Um, but I think that's being attended to more and more. The EU just published a set of green public procurement criteria at EU level, not totally finalised. And there's loads of great stuff on post occupancy. We're thrilled to see it. We actually we just released our European impact report. And we're desperate for a really good case on retrofit and health and productivity. And we quoted in Australia. Actually, they've gone back and collected the data, which it looks a bit weird in the in the European report. But yet, yeah, it just isn't it, it isn't regularly done. But I think more and more, certainly at the policy level, it's, it's being pushed a little bit now, nudged gently, I think, by the EU. But if I may add to that, um, I, I was thinking that you know that you mentioned the Zika Building Syndrome, which it was hugely fashionable, and for some reason it's gone out of fashion. And there was one study uh, from the Whitehawk study conducted. Uh, by some colleagues here at UCL that was showing that actually the, the management of people was perhaps more important than the physical aspect. Um, and so I, I think for me there is a need here to <coughs> remind ourselves that actually people do matter and that we, when we do post occupancy evaluation, we, we shouldn't just uh, you know, think about the building, we should think about the management of people as well. Because otherwise, what we'll end up doing is doing uh, come up with some kind of metrics that show that in theory the building should be healthy, and then we have the same thing as the, the energy gap that the building wasn't healthy. And one of the reasons could be that it's got a horrible manager there or whatever. Um, and we can't, you know, think about those two things in isolation. So there's a, there's, there's an opportunity there, but there's also a risk that the you know, the revival of the city building system will fall down flat because we can't demonstrate that it's a difference because you have to disentangle somehow the social, the management from the physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have that problem with IT. Okay. <laughs> I don't have bad managers, I have bad IT. Well, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I think it's really great that someone's going to answer some measures. But I just wonder how much of an active role the landlord has taken. I don't know, are you, are you the own landlord? Or are you um, the well, it, it varies by office, but um, to a large extent, not. So it's the short answer to that. It's something that we're doing in the offices that we occupy. Because yeah. I think maybe it leads to the point that I might say you made that you know, the landlord developer, so I do think these things are very much in their control. You know, we can have these great initiatives to walk up the stairs the wrong place I mean I think from a from our point of view it's about it's about learning a little bit more about that relationship before we go to okay. landlords and uh, you know building owners and, and and try to say okay look you know you you, you design in this way you you look at products with a, with a certain label and and you will get positive outcomes and we can actually then, uh, measure and demonstrate these outcomes but um, I think at this stage of the process, we, you know, it's it's a learning process for everybody, including ourselves, and depends so very much the first step is to start with our own. Uh, from the research that you have, um, how much of an impact do you find from as 
aspects that were competing in competing interests. Like, for example, having the stairs in prominent location is great, but you also have to look for accessibility and making sure that clips and things aren't hidden around the back and those type of things. Was that an issue in, in this area of health? Well, I mean, from the perspective of active design, I can't necessarily say that we look at that explicitly. Of course, there is the uh, tension between the accessibility agenda, so, you know, you have to make uh, the, the lips accessible to those that, uh, you know, are physically impaired or cannot look so much in the hand of seats, etc. Um, so it is very much about uh, facilitating, you know, the uh, change for people who can and want to do it, as opposed to, uh, you know, putting barriers up for everyone. Yeah. A very good example of that is actually um, airflow rates. Um, obviously, more fresh air, good for people, good for health, good for productivity, very good for productivity. I'm sure Derek uh, and I just left, but he's, he's uh, certainly found that in some of his research. Um, so, there's a trade off. There's a trade off between energy efficiency and, uh, and health. And so, then I think it's about taking all these things into consideration in design processes and you know, designing for healthy buildings in a more sustainable manner. So, so that's an approach to it. Sure. Um, I have a question to myself that um, there's a set of very interesting studies looking at the human door uh, building design. As you said, it's uh, quite um, learning from the outdoor um, master design, so there's, uh, there's a production level. That are designed to promote the um, physical activities so that will reduce the health impact. So, there's very few studies actually that goes in the health course. So, I, I have a comment about the uh, healthful negative consequence that you promote uh, physical activity in doors because providing the indoor position the same, if you increase the physical activity, like, that's possible to increase the Indoor and indoor expansion as well. So um, probably that's kind of a balance between the health benefits. So, so, so are you saying that if the outdoor is polluted, then so it will be indoor, and therefore if we try to increase the physical activity, we will be exposed to it more. I didn't quite get what you. I mean, there's a, 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 there's a active building as it says promotes the physical activity indoors. Mm -hmm. So if uh, if we say the indoor pollution levels are the same, mm -hmm. but if you increase the physical activity and increase the pollution rate, and at the close to it, it can increase the indoor exposure as well. Yeah. So I, I should say the active design doesn't per se. Um, uh, wants to encourage physical activity indoors. Yeah. It's more to do with the fact that because people are indoors a lot of the time, uh, we are trying to uh, kind of capture them where they're spending most of their time, which is indoors. But of course, if there were opportunities for people to be active outdoor uh, in you know clean air, etc., that would be possibly even better. But in some cases, it's not possible for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. It's uh, another thing. I think active design it isn't. It isn't about doing exercises, exercise class at lunchtime. Is it? It's about getting people together, and move around the building a bit more in their in, in their daily activities because that is generally generally good for you. But I I imagine that isn't going to uh, increase your breathing rate a great deal. Yes, yes. So you know, it is about. Um, in, in the sort of research that we were doing, we, of course, we were not talking about aerob aerobic exercise, etc. It was more about the general idea of can people just move more, generally more, as in walking more, you know, standing more, uh, rather than necessarily, uh, you know, running and you know, etc. Which also is important, but isn't necessarily what we were looking at. Yeah, Rob. Um, yeah, I read this um, report from a year ago from the UK Times so that they. So some of the new build flats were at a high risk of like low heating and reduce this um, topic of increase of emitting a zero and carbon emissions in 2016. Yeah, so the Good Homes Alliance is a partner organisation to align sustainable building products. So yeah. we're, we're in the same room. Uh, so we, we looked at overheating um, and tried to see if there's any sort of commonality between house types um, and it's actually not quite so much modern homes but mainly conversions and certainly top floor 
flat had like a version of stuff where actually, and, and, and buildings where you couldn't open windows was the sort of next big thing. But that's a, there's a really useful report on, because no, no, we didn't know in this country how many buildings overheat, just, you know, what, what, uh, what's the numbers? Um, and uh, so we, as the Good Homes Alliance, they try to answer that question. And it's on their website, gha.org.uk, if you want to have a look at that. I think we should also wrap it up there. I'd like to thank the speakers in the usual way. And perhaps you'll come upstairs and join us for a glass of wine. And uh, please uh, carry on the conversations. And hopefully we'll see you at Resource uh, in March. Thank you very much. Thank you.